No, but uh, Courtney is a widow, and uh, widows are great soil. The Bible has a lot to say about taking care of widows. Um, Pastor Shanda, it's great to have you today, Pastor of Fireplace Fellowship, and um, just good to be in the presence of the Lord. Before I get into the Word, I, I just want to say thank you to so many of you who uh, gave cards and gifts celebrating my birthday, and uh, many of you uh, donated to the new building uh, in, in our name, and I think probably about $10,000 came in for the new building. <laughs> so, uh, thankful for that. Um, I have a word of the Lord today for us. Uh, God has uh, put in my spirit. We're going to be reading out of Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse 8. <clears throat> Thank you, Pastor Randy. Pastor Randy and I have known each other for at least 30 years. Um, I preached for him many times on the field and... Um, it's just wonderful to have uh, minister friends. I look at two, two ministers on the front row that I have known for so many years that we have walked hand in hand, and we got a lot of scars, <clears throat> but we don't have wounds. And uh, I, I feel like God is beginning to talk to me about a message on uh, scars. And uh, scars don't hurt. Scars declare triumph. Yes, <clears throat> Ephesians um, chapter 4, verse 8, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, but what is it? But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. I, really, if I was writing the Bible, I would have made uh, verse 9 before verse 8. I would have flipped them. Verse 10, And he that descended is the same also that ascended far above all heavens, <clears throat> that he might fill all things. Now, Holy Spirit, you have been so powerful in this building. You're still here. We have made room for you today. We are waiting to hear what the Lord has to say to us. Now, Holy Spirit, you are the preacher, and I am the vessel. So preach through me today to those that are listening around the world and those that are in this building. In Jesus' name, amen. I need a Kleenex, please. Thank you. Thank you. Trusting that none of you will leave the church now that your pastor is an old man officially. <clears throat> I was thinking about this today as I was coming in because I don't remotely feel 70 years old, but um, I think health determines how old we are and not age, not number. And I thank God for health, and I would encourage you to take care of yourselves because some of your most vibrant, purposeful-filled times in your life can be when you are older. Don't forfeit what God has put in you because you did not take care of yourselves. And Paul said this, I've learned to bring my body under subjection. And so it is important that we do that. Um, I would entitle this message today, When Your Darkest Hour Becomes Your Greatest Triumph. I chose Ephesians chapter 4 because it's one of the very few places in the Bible that tell us the story <clears throat> of what happened between crucifixion and resurrection. Jesus, when he came on the scene, he began to enter into 
unparalleled success. Writers would, men of his day would say this, we've never seen this before. Nobody has ever healed a blind man. Nobody has ever healed somebody from leprosy. The Pharisees became jealous because Jesus didn't have a little church. The Bible said that people would flock to his meetings. One scripture talks about that the crowd was thick, that he could just walk out somewhere, and immediately there was a magnetism about him that brought in thousands of people. He was so successful that he could preach for three days, and nobody would leave to eat. He was profound. He was captivating. He ascended into a realm that no man had ever walked into. Uh, He didn't, he wasn't never broke. If he needed money, he would just command a fish to grab a coin off of the bottom of the ocean and they would just pull it out of the mouth of a fish. Uh, If his men and women that he was ministering to needed to eat, he didn't call a canteen truck. Uh, He just took a little boy's lunch of five loaves and two fishes and would just touch it in the name of the Father, and all of a sudden, 20,000 people got filled. When he needed to get across the lake and there was no boat, he just stepped out on the water and started walking. Hallelujah. There wasn't nobody like him. He didn't know defeat. When demons came against him, he would just look at him and say, shut up, boy, and come out of him. They'd throw him on the ground and walk out, and they were healed by the power of God. That's the kind of Jesus, hallelujah, that walked the shores of Galilee. That's the same Jesus that you are in link with today. Uh, That's the same Jesus, hallelujah, that's on the inside of you, uh, that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit uh, of the Lord raises up a standard against us. There is no demon that comes against you today uh, that the God in you has not already made provision. Uh, You got a God in you, hallelujah, that can walk through the darkest hour, climb the highest mill, uh, steal the strongest storm, uh, rebuke the meanest devil, and Come out full of the Holy Ghost. He was the light of the world. He brought hope to men. He terrified an ungodly government. He shook up a counterfeit messenger. He confronted a dead church, looked at sorry leaders that were hypocrites and looked in their eyes and said, you're vipers and you're snakes and your daddy's the devil and he was a liar and so are you. (laughs) Political correctness did not apply to Jesus. He violated every ethical rule there was when it came to how to deal with the public. Why? Because he was on a mission, hallelujah. He was speaking the words that his father heard. He could just walk up to teenage boys who were in their father's fishing business and say, it's time to leave him and follow me. He had such magnetism about him. He was a man's man. They just look at their dad and say, I got to go. Drop their nets. Most of his disciples were teenage boys. They weren't 30 and 40 year old men. And they followed him. He could look at a tax collector that had a lot of money and he'd say, follow me. And he forgot about cheating the poor or whatever because he was changed by the presence of Jesus. So we're talking about unparalleled success. We're talking about a level of ministry and success that nobody in his day had ever achieved until prophecy needed to be fulfilled. And when the fullness of time came that Isaiah and David, some of the old prophets, 
had declared would happen. And Calvary begins to emerge out of the clouds of the future and become a reality. In a moment, what had been his brightest time begins to turn into his darkest moment. Not evolving over time, but quickly. It was without warning that he's sitting and he looks and he can discern and he can see in the spirit. My friend who I have broken bread with has already sold me to my enemy. And his heart begins to break. And he begins to tell his disciples, I know it doesn't look like it, but things are getting ready to change. The winds of adversity are beginning to blow. There's a chill of evil in the air. And immediately, here comes Judas with the chief priests and the high priests, and Jesus is arrested. And what was the day before <clears throat> the glorious stories of hanging out with the most powerful man in the earth who could do anything. Now he is being bound and led away. It, gets, it begins to get so dark. It begins to look so evil that everything that Jesus had achieved up until that time begins to dissipate and begins to be reversed. The disciple that he has his highest hopes on, that he said, the devil wants to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith faileth not. Sometimes you got to fail, but God won't let your faith fail because your faith, hallelujah, when you fail is going to reach into the darkness of your night and God's faith in you, hallelujah, is going to jerk you out of the miry clay and set you on the solid rock that when the enemy hallelujah has taken his last breath you are still standing on the word of the Lord and you can say naked I came out of my mother's womb naked shall I return thither but the Lord is triumphant <clears throat> and we see a 180 degree turn His prized pupil, he can hear it by the Spirit. And he's hearing Peter say, I hate him. I hope they kill him. I don't know who he is. And a knife is going through the heart of Jesus because nobody loved like Jesus. Nobody could feel the depth of compassion like this man because he had a God heart. He watches as the men that for three and a half years he has poured the very soul of himself into, that he has anointed them and he has given them authority to cast out demons and heal the sick. And he's remembering the joyful times of reunion when they would come back to him and say, we did this and we did that. And he's thanking, hallelujah, that things are going well. And now all of a sudden, they're running for their lives and they are denying the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, he said this, uh, uh, not just about Peter said, Lord, I will never deny you. And the scripture says, likewise, said all of the other disciples. It wasn't just Peter. It's a dark day when what you have poured into for years begins to fall apart. And it looks like it's permanent. Because it represents your virtue, your purpose. It's what gave you credibility. It's what gave you your worth. A 
And now his disciples have forsaken him. Unbridled hatred rises out of the abyss of hell. And these men that have stood on the fringes of the crowd and wanted to get him, but they couldn't now. It's like the wall of protection has been removed. And every demon in hell has come after Jesus. And as we watch, they would stand back, take their hand, and slap him across the face. Some would clear their throat and get a mouthful of spit and then spit in his face while he was blindfolded and say, oh, you are the son of God. Tell me who did that. This pious, glorious, innocent man is now stripped naked. What a humiliating experience to take the Lamb of God who was of such ethical standards and had kept himself pure to be uncovered before his tormentors. Nothing hid. And then they robed him in a purple robe and they would mock him and say, Hail, King of the Jews. And then they begin to physically tear his body apart. His mama <clears throat> winds up home with her heart ripped up because she just watched her son murdered in a hideous display of unbridled hatred. It is so bad that the sun hid itself. And as the darkness of evil permeated the atmosphere, even the sun ran, could not look at what they had done to Jesus. And as that evening comes to a close, the darkest moment of Jesus' life closes in on him. And as he's hanging the Bible says, cursed is he who hangs on a cross. As he's hanging cursed, almost completely naked, heads tore up, holes in his cheek where they ripped out the beard. All of his disciples that he was depending on are gone. His mama's trying to hold her sanity together. All the people that he healed, none of them came to stand and cheer him on and say, you can do this. No leopards came to say, I just wanted to say thank you. You changed my life. There wasn't a thank you issued. And as the blood <clears throat> dropped from the brow of the thorns, and you can hardly see, he lifts his head up. And he says, Father, into thy hands do I commend my spirit. And he went, oh, and he died. And that was his dark hour. It looked like that the prophetic of the prophets had missed it. It looked like that what God had declared down through the decades and the millennials of prophetic men who had penned what they felt by the Holy Spirit declaring to them was just a fable because it is so dark. And that day, the ministry of Christ who ruled for three years that touched the world 
that brought thousands to him that did things nobody else could do, that brought hope to the world, that little children wanted to sit on his lap, and old people, hallelujah, loved him, and the lame would walk, and the blind would see, and the lepers were cleansed, and it was just on and on that day. It all came to a crashing end, and we watched the very essence of pure hell and hatred and evil begin to arise in rule and hell begin to celebrate I have to believe that the high priests and the Sadducees and the Pharisees and those that hated Jesus Christ so much are partying and celebration that the man that tormented us we beat him But can I tell you, what looks like your darkest hour, hallelujah, can turn into your greatest triumph. Because the Bible said, <clears throat> except a seed fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. So there's two things that we have to realize. Number one, they didn't kill a man. They messed with the seed. He was called the seed of David. He was called the seed of God. Now, hell should never mess with a godly seed because you can't bury a seed. And you may think you're burying a seed, but when you take a God seed and put it in the ground, you may not intend it, but you just planted it. And what goes in the ground when it's planted and it's got God DNA in it ain't going to stay in the ground, but somewhere down the road that seed hallelujah is going to begin to germinate something's going to begin to happen something's going to begin to break open and the ground's going to begin to part and out of that ground is going to become not the seed but the harvest I'm preaching to some people right now. You may feel like you've been buried, but I'm declaring by the word of the Lord, if you got Jesus in you, when hell planted you in your grave, you are coming out by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But see, the enemy doesn't know all of the ins and outs. Because while they've buried, they've planted the body, they couldn't, they couldn't kill the spirit. They couldn't kill the word. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of God liveth and abideth forever. John 1.1, 1, 1. in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and Word was God. John 1 and 14 says, and the Word was made flesh. Amen. And so we are not dealing with a man. We are dealing with the eternal Word of God. Amen. We are dealing with the same entity that stood on the edge of nothing and looked at a chaotic earth that hell had ravished and the word begins to speak and without ever physically touching the, what the enemy had tore up the word begins to speak creation hallelujah the enemy should have never buried the word because the word is seed and that day when they buried him it looks like it's dark. There are no miracles taking place. There are no healing crusades that Jesus is conducting. There are no wonderful amount of beatitude dissertations being issued out of his mouth. They're not watching him confuse the leaders of that day and the lawyers with the wisdom that is in him. 
Everybody has scattered. Even the men on the road to Emmaus are in depression because everybody thinks that this dark moment is permanent. But I can tell you that while hell was celebrating on top of the earth and the seed was laying in the soil, Ephesians says that the God part of him, the deity of Jesus Christ, hallelujah, began to come out of that tomb and began to go inward. And he began to go through granite rock. He began to go through lava. See, he didn't have that physical limitation anymore. I'm declaring by the word of the Lord that some of you are having limitations lifted off of you because you are no longer functioning in the fleshly realm. But God is bringing to a realm of the spirit where God says, I'll make a way when there is no way. Yea, though I walk through the valley, of the saddle of death I shall fear no evil for the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord for the just shall walk by faith we are not going down hallelujah but I'm telling you that while the enemy is celebrating the earth right now with all the mess that they're doing and it looks like the church has done gone under with all of the black eyes we got I declare by the spirit of the Lord that there is a prophetic anointing of God that is going down into the pits of hell because God is not done. Oh, yeah, Baba Sunday. Hallelujah. You cannot kill God, you can't kill the church. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. But if the Spirit, let, let's go to 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Now if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. If you look up mortal in the Greek, it means dead. Shall also quicken your dead bodies by the spirit that dwelleth in you. <clears throat> The enemy can make life miserable for a season. But the spirit of Christ that's in you, the enemy cannot kill. Sometimes the, the devil wins because he tricks people who have great potential in God to get in a mental state that they want to die. Because they want to escape the battle, the hardship of their environment. Not realizing that once you die, you don't make a difference. That you got to get past a place that the enemy so intimidates you that you want to throw in the towel and just pray for God to come get you out. I want to live as long as God needs me to live. You need to live as long as God needs you to live because the Spirit of Christ that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that when the enemy buries you, hallelujah, and says it's over, slaps a shovel on top of the grave, 
and drops a rose and says, see long. Then about three days later, hallelujah, something begins to tremble in the atmosphere and somebody is coming out of their grave and going to shake hell by the Spirit of the Lord. It's in that moment that it looks like it's your darkest night. It's when you can do your greatest damage to the enemy because, and I know this from a personal experience, that it's when it looks like it's over. It's when if you will say as David... Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O God, that I will not accuse you. There are going to be seasons where you will never understand God. God is not going to explain it. He's just going to tell you, I'm going to have to make you walk by faith. The Lord never showed Abraham that he was going to raise Isaac from the dead. <clears throat> he just told him that Isaac, hallelujah, is going to father many nations. But somewhere that Abraham, the father of faith, what was he going from? He was going from the metamorphosis of Abram who had no children to the metamorphosis of Abraham father of many nations and he had to go through a dark night where he's got his son tied up like a sacrificial animal and he's got a knife raised over his only firstborn that he loves out of Sarah's womb he is the joy of his life he's hunted with him, fished with him sat with him and talked with him and dreamed about the boys that are going to come out of the loins of Isaac and God says kill him. You will never change the world until you walk through hell backwards with your hair on fire and still come out with victory in your spirit and a shout in your mouth that you can say the Lord gives and the Lord takes but blessed be the name of the Lord. Is there anybody in this building that can tell the devil you're going to have to do better than this because I'm still standing by the power of the Holy Ghost that there's anointing in me, that the yoke's going to be broken, that you better enjoy your party because I'm getting ready to invade your house. This is why I'm very careful about this, Psalms 34 and 1. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. I didn't always live there. There were too many dark times when the enemy stole my praise. And it was in those times that God in his mercy sustained me and has sustained you. But the reason praise has to continually be in your mouth is because if praise is in your mouth, unbelief can't come out. Hallelujah. Praise is in your mouth. Agreement with your circumstances will not happen. If praise is in your mouth, you're going to eventually make demons uncomfortable because demons don't like praise. And after a while, when you sing, I got to praise and I got to let it out, the devil says, I can't take this anymore. I'm leaving here because praise makes me nervous. Is there some praise in this building? Is there some Somebody, hallelujah, in the Holy Ghost uh, that can declare there ain't no rock like my rock and no God like my God. Sunday. See, many times what we don't realize. It's when things are going great, it's because we're in a natural realm. Business is great, marriage is great, kids are great. But the devil is never defeated in a natural realm. This is why the Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not natural weapons. 
because we are not fighting a natural battle. But we are wrestling against flesh and blood and, or against principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. So the first thing that happens that you have to understand is when it gets dark, what's happened is it's amped it up because you have shifted now from a natural war, a natural realm, to a spiritual battle. See, the enemy thought that if I can physically kill Jesus, I win. But they didn't realize that when they put him in the grave, all they did was loose him from natural limitations. Because Ephesians says that while they're parting on top of the earth and celebrating and they're high-fiving and drinking Bud Light and smoking pot, doing all kinds of whatever the enemy does, they just lose the greatest nuclear spiritual power that existed in the existence of mankind. Hallelujah. And as that body wrapped up in that shroud, and it's all bloody and, and wounded and torn up, that the word, hallelujah, that had been inside of it begins to work out. <clears throat> It has to come out of the mouth. This is why when you read the scriptures and when they go in and it says they find the grave clothes laying there, but the napkin that wrapped the head is folded up and it's over by itself. The word just kind of worked right out of the grave clothes that wrapped the body and it got up in the mouth. Hallelujah, and that wrap came off of that head, and the Holy Spirit folded it up because there are some things now that need to be uttered in hell that have to be not muted. I'm declaring to you that I think in 2020, the coronavirus was where the world thought they buried the church, wrapped us up with a mask silenced us and shut our doors. It wasn't businesses that were deemed, what's the word? Essential? Because porn houses didn't get shut down. Liquor stores didn't get shut down. Walmart didn't get shut down. Nancy Pelosi's hair salon didn't get shut down. <clears throat> Now, that's funny. <clears throat> Can I get a witness on that one? <laughs> Lord, I apologize for that. <clears throat> but it became a dark day because the church building became silent, became empty. People began to lose their hope. And it was a worldwide epidemic. It wasn't limited to one nation or one third world nation or a particular tri-state area. This was a worldwide. Why? Because the devil understands that if I don't do something, there's a harvest coming. Because Matthew 13 says that the end of the world, if the end of the age is harvest. So that the Spirit of God, the Word of the Lord, the deity of God came out of the natural body. And Ephesians says he begins to journey. Where is he going? Where are you going, Jesus? I'm going to hell. Because there's some things down there that the devil stole from me. That I need when I'm resurrected. To birth the church. <clears throat> well, what do you need? He says, well, faith's locked up down there. It's in a man called Abraham. Yeah. 
And I've already prophesied in the last days I'll raise up the tabernacle of David. And David's down there, and I need to get him out. Hallelujah. He says, there's some men and women down there that I need to bring up. And while hell is parting, they have no idea what's going on in the spirit realm. Because about that time, the word of God hit the gates of hell. This is why the word said, upon this rock will I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against them. Who is the rock? It is the rock of ages. Who is the rock of ages? It's the living incarnate word word of God and when the word knocked on the gate in fact I don't think he knocked on the gate I think he just kicked the door in and when he went in there's demons standing there with a Michelo in their hand and they go I thought you were dead he said my death has been greatly exaggerated because I am he who was dead but I am alive forevermore and he said I've come down to get the keys to death to hell and to the grave and he said you may be partying up there, but he said, my darkest hour has turned into my greatest victory because I am coming out of here with the spoils of hell. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hell had two compartments, Hades, where the unbeliever went, and Sheol. Where Old Testament saints were. And Jesus just walked in. And the revival that the enemy thought he shut down on top of the earth broke out in hell. Because Isaiah looked over, Ezekiel said, That's him. That's who I saw in my vision. David said, oh, that's my son in the spirit. Hallelujah. Some of the others said, in fact, the thief on the cross said, I was just with him. And he told me that today I'm going to be with him in paradise. But he didn't look like that. He looks well. And Jesus walked over and said, hello, fellas. He said, we're getting ready to march out of here. And he took the keys. Walked over to the devil with that long Darth Vader robe on. <laughs> and the devil's standing there trembling. He said, I believe you got something that belongs to me. Reached over into that long, deep pocket. Come out with the keys. Hallelujah, of death and hell. And he said, from now on, these belong to me. Oh, and they begin to walk over. And what the enemy don't know on top of the earth, because they're celebrating, and his disciples are in depression, and his mom's got a broken heart. But in their darkest night, they don't realize that they are on the preface, hallelujah, of some resurrection anointing that's getting ready to take place, and some prophetic word of God that has already been declared over the church. And I declare to you uh, that we are not dead. Uh, for in the last days, hallelujah, the glory of the latter house uh, shall be greater than that of the former. And God saying this, uh, that when the God comes back, uh, he's coming back with a shout uh, that his body's going to be healed. Uh, and we are released uh, by the Spirit of the Lord. When you go through metamorphosis from when God allows you to go through that darkest time of your night, that's where it looks like the enemy buries you. But all that gets buried are your limitations and your restrictions that will hinder the purpose that you're getting ready to step into. And many of us whether you're in this building or you're listening to me online, you don't realize it, but you're already in the middle of great change. Amen. Say, Pastor, why am I fighting? Because you've been a caterpillar and you're tearing a cocoon apart because there's no room for your wings. But they that wait upon the Lord, <laughs> hallelujah, shall renew their strength. They shall what? They shall grow wings. 
They shall mount up with wings. Hallelujah. Not of a caterpillar, but of an eagle. Hallelujah. You know what an eagle does when its adversary comes against it? It just spreads its wings, and it just begins to go a little higher and a little higher. And eventually, every predator that could take an eagle down has to fall away because they cannot attain to the heights that that eagle has attained to by the Spirit of the Lord. Somebody in this building right now is making another circle in the spirit and your enemy that got on your back is going to be terrified they're going to say why don't we go back down a little lower but you're saying no I'm going to pray some more and I got to do some more praising and the devil says but look how bad it is and you say hold on I'm going a little higher God I want to praise you I want to thank you that when the enemy comes in like a flood the Spirit of the Lord raises up a standard against it. God, I want to praise you that as long as there's breath in my mouth, I will not curse you. God, I want to praise you. Pretty soon you look, you're so high up. Hallelujah. Where's your accusers? Lord, they are gone. Oh, and the Lord says, welcome to another place in the Spirit of the Lord. Your darkest hour is when you're going to do your greatest damage to the enemy. Your darkest night. It's when you're going to wreck hell and bring it down by the Spirit of the Lord. Stand with me. Hallelujah. 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 Somebody that's got their wings spread needs to run to the front of this altar and begin to praise God. There's some of you that feel like the devil has buried me. I'm giving you an altar call right now. Is there praise in your spirit? Is there somebody, hallelujah, that can tell the devil my darkest night? Now this is what I want you to get. The same men that killed Jesus when he was resurrected never touched him again. Three days later, three days later, all it took for three days to knock the wind out of those Pharisees that when Jesus came out of the grave, the same guys that killed him never attempted to touch him again because you can't touch resurrection. And I was listening to Reinhard Bonk. He made a statement. He said, when Joseph of Arimathea came to Pilate, he asked for the body of Jesus. And Pilate said, well, he's probably not dead. And he sent somebody to see, and they broke his legs. And Pilate was amazed because historically, <clears throat> it took about three days for someone to die who was crucified. It's, that's how torturous it was, how long it took. <clears throat> Within a few hours, Jesus was already gone. This is my point. If you have divine purpose in you, God will shorten the time span of suffering. That what the enemy says is going to be like everybody else. This is how long you're going to suffer. God says, no, I got something for him to do. And he just, he just by days. Jesus should have suffered on that cross for days. Father said, that wasn't his purpose. I just needed him planted. Boom. I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying that God is getting ready to shorten the process that some of you are going through and weeping may endure for a night. <clears throat> But joy cometh in the morning. And this is what I want you to get in your spirit. 
what looked like <clears throat> Jesus' darkest day to the world was his greatest victory of his ministry because he permanently emptied Sheol out. And to this day, <clears throat> there is nobody in Sheol. It's like taking a tour through Alcatraz. The cells are empty, and they can say, this is what used to be. But Jesus is saying, that's where they used to be. That's where faith was. That's where David was. That's where Ezekiel was. Elisha was. But they're with me. And the Bible says that when Jesus came out of the grave, they came out right after him and testified in Jerusalem. The church, what the world should have left us alone. Whoever concocted this virus should have never done it because it's going to cost them. Because out of it, there is a church that has been planted that's coming out of the grave and we're going back, hallelujah, and we're going to empty Sheol of our prodigals of our health, of our finances, hallelujah. And we're going to bring in the final harvest by the Spirit of the Lord. I want Jasmine to come lead us in worship for a moment. And I want faith to begin to arise in your heart, hallelujah. I want you to begin to declare. Quit focusing on how bad it is. And I want you to begin to ask God by the Spirit.